As always, please try the question first before moving on. In the first part of this problem, we're going to use the conservation of mechanical energy, and we will be using the floor as a reference point, and that point will have a height of zero. So here we have the conservation of mechanical energy. The question implies that the ball is released from rest, so initially there will be no kinetic energy. We can substitute in the relevant expressions for the potential and kinetic energies. Notice here that the kinetic energy has been broken up into two parts. We have the kinetic energy of the ball in a linear fashion as it slides down and around the track, and then we have the rotational kinetic energy because as the ball is moving in a translational or linear fashion, it's also spinning as it goes down the track. So there's also going to be some rotational kinetic energy. Notice as well that the initial height of the ball is simply going to be h, so we can replace this value with h. Notice also that when the ball reaches the top of the track, its height is going to be two radii. You have the radius from the top of the track to the center of the circle, and then another radius to the ground level. So the overall height there would be 2r. So that means we can replace this term right here with 2r. Also notice that the term i, which is the rotational inertia of the solid brass ball, that can be replaced as well with the expression 2 fifths times the mass of the ball times the radius squared of the ball. That expression would come from a table of rotational inertias depending on the shape of the object. In this case, we have a, a solid ball. And if you look up in your textbook the table for the rotational inertias of different objects, you should see 2 fifths times mr squared as the rotational inertia of a solid ball. Let's also notice that omega, which is the angular velocity, can be replaced with the following expression. We know that omega is equal to the velocity about the center of mass divided by the radius of the object. And it turns out it'll be easier to work this problem if we make that substitution as well. And we can actually square both the numerator and denominator separately in this fraction. In that way, the radius squared in the numerator here can cancel with the radius squared in the denominator here. We can also eliminate mass from all the terms since it appears in all four of these terms. These twos will also cancel, and you'll notice that we have like terms here and here. This term is one half v squared, and this term over here is one fifth v squared, so we can add those together. And then this term can be written as just two gr. It turns out that keeping this equation solved for gh is going to be most helpful. So let's just leave it as is and maybe set it aside so we can use it later. Let's next consider the ball as it's on the verge of leaving the track right here at the top of the loop. What we can do is draw a free body diagram for that situation. In fact, it's a very simple free body diagram because when the ball is on the verge of leaving the track, it's really not touching the track, and so the only force acting on the ball would be the gravitational force. It's essentially in free fall at that moment. Now, of course, it still is moving on a circular path, so we can apply Newton's second law for circular motion. As noted, the only force, which turns out to be the centripetal force, is the gravitational force, mg. So we can plug mg in for the centripetal force. Mass will cancel from both terms. We can actually then multiply both sides of this equation by r so that we can solve for v squared. And what's convenient about that is that the first equation we derived also has a v squared term in it. So we're going to make a substitution. We can replace the v squared in our first equation with the term rg. Conveniently, g appears in all the terms of this equation now, so we can eliminate it from the equation. And now we have a nice equation solved for h. Please keep in mind that although I used a lowercase r for the radius, that had referred to the radius of the circular loop, so that really should have been capital R. Now when we plug in capital R, which was 14 centimeters, we're going to obtain the following result for the height. 37.8 centimeters. So that would be the correct answer for part A. Now for part B of the question, we can again begin by using the conservation of mechanical energy. Notice that we've already broken up the final kinetic energy into its two forms, the translational kinetic energy and then the rotational kinetic energy. We also substitute in 2 fifths times mr squared for the i or rotational 
inertia value for the small brass ball. And then instead of omega squared, we did the substitution of v squared over r squared, just like we did before. In fact, those r squareds will, will cancel. The ball presumably was released from rest again, so there's no initial kinetic energy. This time the ball is released from a height of six times the radius of the loop. So we'll keep that in mind when we plug in for the initial height. Now the final height will be located over here at point Q, and we can see that that's simply the radius of the loop. Let's again eliminate mass from each term of the equation. We can also cancel these twos here. And again, we have the same like terms as before, so we can combine those. Now it turns out that it's going to be most convenient to solve for the v squared term. So we can subtract gr from both sides of this equation and then multiply both sides by 10 sevenths. Let's hang on to that result and then move over to point Q where the ball is rolling around the circular track here. And what we have to recognize again is that because it's rolling around in a circular fashion, a circular direction, there must be a centripetal force. The centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle. And so the center of the circle is to the left of point Q. Newton's second law would apply once again. And now we can see why we solved this equation for v squared. We can make a nice substitution by replacing the v squared with 50 gr over 7. And then when you plug in the known values for the mass and the gravitational constant, the r should actually cancel here. And remember, the mass was stated up here. Make sure you convert that into kilograms, though, by multiplying that by 10 to the minus 3. And you should get 1.96 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons as the answer. And as noted, the direction of that force will be pointing towards the left, since the centripetal force must always point towards the center of the circle.